Uh, first, I'm going to introduce Colonel CA, Colonel California, John Spencer, our keynote speaker, who some call the godfather of urban warfare. Uh, Colonel Spencer uh, serves as the chair of urban warfare studies at the Modern War Institute at West Point, co-director of the Urban Warfare Project, and host of the Urban Warfare Project podcast. How many people have listened to the Urban Warfare Project podcast? That's good. That's good. Great podcast. Um, the, uh, he also serves as a colonel in the California State Guard with assignment to the 40th Infantry Division as the director of urban warfare training. He served over 25 years in the active army as an enlisted infantry and ranger and as an infantry officer, including two combat deployments to Iraq. During his second tour as a company commander, he fought in the urban battle of Sadr City. And later he served as an advisor to the top four-star general and other senior leaders in the U.S. Army as part of a strategic research group from the Pentagon and the United States Military Academy. His research focuses on military operations in dense urban areas, as well as subterranean warfare. Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel T.A. John Spencer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, well, I can't thank General Ward enough, and if you know him, you'll understand he is a, a machine, and this course would not happen if it was not for him. And bar none, I travel the world, there is no other course like this out there. And if they, they claim they are, they're just lying. Uh, there's no course in the world that specializes solely in planning for large-scale combat operations in urban terrain. I'll put a bunch of caveats in there because there, are, there is this, there is that, there is a, a seminar, there is an elective, there is a, a class in this course. There's no other course in the world dedicated to planning for large-scale combat operations in urban terrain, in big urban cities. Uh, I'm going to start the presentation with a video that we did, as General Ward uh, mentioned. My endeavor into studying urban warfare started in 2014 when I was a member of the Chief of Staff of the Army, General Nero's Strategic Studies Group. And that for over a year, we studied mega cities. That means a city over 10 million. That's the definition, just a city with 10 million residents. And could the U.S. military, with the U.S. Army being the land component of that, achieve their mission in a mega city, no matter what they were. And this video was one of the products that we produced in that year. All right, you can put technical rehearsal down on your uh, your your feedback sheets. That's fine. <laughs> the uh, we'll we'll go ahead and skip this. Yep. And if we can get it going, we'll play it before the next one. I also realized that I skipped the introductions. We'll start that before the next presentation after the break. So why don't you kill that so it's not making noise? Thank you. All right. Thanks, sir. No, no worries. It's a it's a really good video. Uh, it just giving you highlighting that John is a operating urban train in general, megacities specifically. This is in the court on megacities. Actually, megacities became a dirty word after that year because it was brought to Congress, brought to the U.S. Army, brought around the world. I'm like, no, we can't. Basically, we can't. There's only 40, you know, 30 plus, 40-ish megacities. And, and it allows for people to cognitively, as we'll talk about in this course, kind of say, that's too big of a problem. We just won't do it. That's not a choice that most militaries of the world get, though. You, you're going to go where you're told to go. And like General Orr said, the concept, as I studied for that year, how is the Army designed, as in how the, the, the entire force design of the U.S. military designed for environments, not designed for urban areas. And that's why I studied the negative. But it became a dirty word. And then 
that term megacities had a, a long thread of intellectual activity and it became the interpreters. Because there are some megacities that are not that dense. Like Los Angeles has a very flat, you know, not high rise, has high rise areas, and we're gonna look at that in the overplay, but in general it's it's, it's pretty spread out. The density is not there, as opposed to like Taipei or some other places that are extremely dense, and we'll talk about that. Can we go to my slide deck? All right, so we're going to start with the very first introduction, keynote, whatever you call it. We talked about why this course, but why urban warfare? Is it the hardest? Is it the most difficult, the most complex? In my world, it's a debate that, no, you, you should be prepared to do any task in any environment, and as long as you study the basics of whatever it is, even division-level operations, apply that template to any environment, and, and you'll be fine. Well, I've argued, and I argue, and I'll academically argue it, that there is no place harder on the earth to ask the military to conduct military operations than urban areas. And I've actually debated in articles, yep, no, it's not, it's not the hardest. Yes, it is. So I'm going to try to present with the idea of presenting why I think urban warfare is the hardest, why we need this course, why we all, and I learn every day, Although I've been doing this for a little while, uh, and been writing about it, talking about it, podcasting about it for a little while, but I learn something new every day. Next slide. So there's one aspect of people think that, okay, well, urban is not the dominant feature of warfare. It's, it's you know, the battles are going to happen in the open plains, they're going to happen here, here, and here. And as my friends, all the experts that I associate with, because that's really how I become an expert, is have expert friends like Dr. King, Major Giroux, and others. I mean, historically, that is the decisive battle. And, and there's actually a cognitive part. If I ask you about World War II, I ask you about any war, you're going to come back to me with a battle that is associated with an urban area. It's just, there's a reason for that. Because the history of warfare is wars, politics by other means, the political goals of the war, the campaign, the battle, is usually centered over seizing, liberating, taking, controlling the, those centers of gravity, both the political center of gravity, the economic center of gravity, and could be the military center of gravity, the urban. And that's the trend of modern warfare, and I'll talk about Ukraine, where I spend a lot of time right now, because there's no better way. Yes, historians will show you how nothing's new in, in war, it's all happened in the past. Uh, War is evolving. There's a, the enduring nature of war doesn't change, but the ever-changing character of warfare changes. But again, for me, it's like I, I can talk to you all day, but look at Ukraine, look at Nagorno-Karabakh, look at Israel, look at everywhere in the world, the fight, the decisive battle. Yes, there are going to be fights in trenches, in jungle, in open terrain, but the decisive battle that determines the success or failure of the goal of the military or the political apparatus will be over urban terrain. And I can argue that pretty strongly. Now, my friend Dr. King wrote a whole book on this aspect of no military is what it used to be for many reasons. The size of military is completely different than what it was in the 20th century, World War II, War I. And this, that size of militaries combined with the global trend of urbanization and population increase drives military to fight in urban terrain. Another quote that he I use and was one of the inspiring quotes for me to start studying urban warfare in Dr. King's previous book, it says that militaries had a long history of fighting for cities, but not in cities. Even the Battle of Stalingrad, there's more fighting happening outside the city than in the city. But that dichotomy is actually changing and we're seeing that in Ukraine, they're still fighting for cities, but the amount of fighting in cities has increased for many reasons. One of those is just the size of the military. Another is just the size of urban terrain. And you look at in Ukraine, where you can trace many of the battles in Ukraine back to World War II, if not before, 
battles happened in those so many co same locations. They weren't urban back then. They're all urbanized now. So you're going to pass through an urban area, fight for an urban area, or fight in an urban area is the reality of modern combat. And the fact that we don't have a program of record in multiple courses on urban warfare planning is almost criminal. So that's why this course is so important to me. And then you, we could talk about the other range of military operations, just the impact of globalization or global warming and the increase in natural disasters by fivefold of the world means that you know, your disc operations, your theater uh, security cooperation operations will be all focused on urban areas because of the impact of global warming on urban areas. But this is strongly, of course, on LISCO offense, defense. And we did that on purpose because like, we need weeks to talk about the differences in conducting any operation, offense, defense, stability, or disca in urban terrain. We shouldn't have the time, so we're gonna really focus on offense and defense for this course. Next slide. So this is one of the examples, right? So I used to use, and like when we started the Mega Cities thing, I tried to dazzle people with statistics, right? The fact that in 2008, the world became 50% Urbanized for the first time in history, the world became more urban than it was rural, where people were. But really, that starts to gloss over people in their eyes. Like, yeah, so what? I'm not still going to train my military to fight other militaries in the open terrain, destroy the military, and I achieve my objective. Even the fact that it, you're, it's really hard now to find pieces of terrain where you can actually have that fight. Yeah, we're going to show you a place in the desert where you can have a fight in the desert, and it's there's very little rural. I mean, uh, urban, but that's just not the fact. And it, there are all the statistics are just showing the increase, the, the doubling of the population of the world, the doubling of the population of urbanization, even from 1960 to now. I used to start with all that stuff, but I found over a decade that, eh, most people can just, will just wave that off and go back to training in the woods, in the desert, or in the jungles. And this is an example of just showing Hong Kong the difference from 1960 or to 2016. You think that this, which side would be a little bit more challenging to conduct military operations? Next slide. So I also, so all my friends know that this is a slide that I put up in front of every briefing because we all hold something in our mind. When I say urban warfare to you, we all cognitively go somewhere. In our mind about what are we talking about? I'll define urban war for you, urban warfare for you by the military's definition. But urban warfare can be across the entire spectrum and have lots of examples. If you think Black Hawk Down, enter and clear a room, or you think some other large scale Stalingrad, a million man army versus a million man army clashing in your train. My point of showing this slide is that. I'm talking about all of it. Every mission set that a military can actually get in every type of urban area. And that's the fact, and, and the challenge is that we like methodologies, we like heuristics, we like templates that we can apply on anything, whether it's a deliberate attack, step one, two, three, four, whether it's METTC, permissive PT, A scope. But every city is different. So I, I've actually argued strongly that there are gaps in our templates, in our mental models, when we shove militaries into urban areas that get left out, whether that's the flows of the city, whether that's who controls the power of the city, whether that's how the different construction of the buildings will really define the application of military force or not, or the application of just the use of force is different in every scenario, the context. And the greatest predictor of the future is the past. Some of it's the present. So me and, and, and Major Giroux focus a lot about writing summaries of these battles, and I'll talk about that in the resources. Because what we're going to do in urban terrain, we cognitively as a culture, like, oh, I'm going to do this, this, and this. Where I can show you five years ago, that's not what you did when I shoved you into a major urban battle. And that's the, the, the beauty of a study in history. Let, let me show you case studies 
and me and Jason write case studies and try to keep them down to 5,000 words just because I had a short attention span and most people, other people do too. So we've written case studies on what happened at the Battle, the Battle of Stalingrad. But what I found when I present is that even in wars that, whether it's our country or somebody else's, and it's almost a, a pun on the use of the word, there are urban legends about what happened in urban battles. And what I found is that they're usually not right. Like, no, that, it didn't go that well for you. Well, you, there were, it went well for that unit, but not this unit. Because of the uniqueness of the urban terrain under the context of that city, that political guidance, that weapon technology, in every one of these, there, there's a lesson. So whether you think, when I say urban warfare, if you think counterterrorism from you know, Munich to seizing Osama bin Laden, or you think counterinsurgency from the global war on terrorism, or do you think large-scale combat operation against a pure enemy, and, and you know, I tried to do a rhyme or a reason in here, or do you think permissive environment, non-permissive environment, because there is a, a giant chasm difference between conducting a military operation in a permissive environment, as in where you have host nation support, population support, you have uh, partners there, versus entering a non-permissive environment where the peer enemy has control of the urban train and every window is a threat. Every 360 aspect of that non-permissive environment, there's night and day differences on, on how the execution of the mission will go. I'll try to show you throughout this course that we all hold on to some bias that this is, this is what we're taking forward into this environment that we will, it will be non-permissive until we get there. Or you know, or be permissive. We'll drive to the city and we'll start fighting at the city. Well, I, no, you're gonna pass through like 10 urban areas to get there, and I'll show you where the, the, the war has been lost before they got to the objective. And that's why, I, another reason why I'm such a, a, a super fan of this course is because I, I, we can show you how usually Failure in urban battles starts in planning. And that's why this course is here. So when every one of you are back in your set, have a seat at the table and whatever the plan is, you have some now tools because that's what it's all about. Whether it's a it's a an NFL playbook of plays you can play out in the urban terrain that are different than you do in other terrains, that is a tool and a resource. So you know, I, I I'm a, a urban warfare geek, so I try to study all of these, but each one of them is different. So when we say urban warfare, let's be clear on what we're talking about. Next slide. Now, I'm going to, again, present to you why it's the hardest. And I, I'm very careful on the words I use because people argue, and literally I've written multiple articles arguing against that John Spencer is crazy. Don't listen to him. He just wants to convince you that urban's hard. And it's not, here's the reason why it's not hard. It's no harder than fighting in a cherry orchard. Or, you know, I, I, I've heard it all. So, so let's start with the reasons why I think it's hard. Number one, physical terrain. Some people have called the urban terrain the great equalizer because it negates most military capabilities. Because it's it's a ready built, a ready built military obstacle. In, all the dimensions, whether it's a concrete bunker of steel reinforced concrete, which you're going to find very challenging. And I have here a longtime friend, CJ Drew, who's the world's leading expert on fires in urban terrain. Uh, you're going to find that most of, even your fires get negated in urban terrain. You can't see in the urban terrain. You can't see through concrete. You can't see underground if you're not in it. it just by the nature of the physical terrain, it degrades the world's best equipment. I mean, why do you, when you go to New York City or in downtown Los Angeles, your GPS starts going crazy? Because the clutter of the urban terrain, there is a science to what it does to the electric, electromagnetic spectrum, to line of sight technology, to GPS. It messes it up, it makes it harder because the equipment starts not to work. You go underground, because the urban terrain is multidimensional in all the terrains, and we'll talk about this in Urban 101, whether it's even flying into urban terrain, it's different than other terrains. It has its own climate, its own winds, and it's, 
They had underground. If you go into the underground, none of your military equipment works. You can't see, navigate, communicate under there. You can be one block away, and there can be things that are making all the warfighting functions more harder to do than any other terrain. I like the part about, so I had this thing I do about um, uh, our, our assumptions, and I'll talk about that, but defending urban terrain is both an advantage and a disadvantage. But there's no other terrain on the planet which is ready-made military defenses. <coughs> Hardened bunkers that you couldn't create if you wanted to, or you could, but it would take you decades to create some of the hardened bunkers that are readily available in any city. So there's an advantage to getting there, there's, there's a disadvantage to going there. Uh, that plays into just the physical terrain. Even the aspect of where all of our armies, I'm sure, think that they're, they're, they are maneuver warfare armies. Because maneuver warfare is king, it, it, is, it defines most militaries of the, the modern era, and I don't disagree with that. But then people will then say, okay, let's apply your maneuver warfare theory to its urban terrain over kilometers and kilometers. Just common sense that I can't spread out in urban terrain. There are roads, alleys, urban canyons that canalize me. So what am I maneuvering? And if I am maneuvering, is it not harder than if I was maneuvering in other places? It, it, it canalizes. It, it makes maneuver warfare more difficult. Next slide. So before I go on, maybe, I know there's a timer, but <laughs> at 10 o'clock, if I have not finished talking, stand up and start screaming. <laughs> because there's a fairy tale that last year, well, I went over by like 30 minutes <laughs> into my, my best, one of my closest friends' time. So at 10 o'clock, because I, I love this topic so much, I, I can sometimes can keep going. Everybody stand up and start yelling. Your time's over. Uh, so I like this aspect too. Not that you know we're not talking that much about tactics in this course. We're talking about planning. But as a planner, you try to forecast down to the challenges of the tactical unit. And if the urban terrain, like what does it change for our tactical units? And it degrades GPS signals. It degrades the we the weapons technologies that the tools that we give them. All the tools. And we'll talk about, well, then maybe you should give them different tools. Well, what, what tools do I need to give them that's different? Well, I have, we have a list. You need some engineering assets. You need different type of fires. You need different types of everything. Literally, it, it, change, it should change everything, but that's what a planner does. Whether it's task organization, what type of units, what type of special equipment. If there's an underground, we'll talk about that. And try to give you the tools. I mean, this is the example from Doc and just showing you that, okay, yeah, tanks are vulnerable. There are gaps in their coverage, but there, there is plenty of urban warfare history, and I'm a strong proponent of, it, proponent of this too. And to quote an Israeli general on my podcast, is that no smart soldier ever goes into urban terrain without a tank, and only a dumbass one does. You need mobile protected firepower in urban terrain, but it has vulnerabilities just by the nature of the three dimensional space of urban terrain. Now, does anybody recognize the photo on the right? It's a pretty famous photo for me. Somebody got it? Uday and Kuse. That's right. So that's um, when we were in uh, Iraq in 2003 searching for the HVT, Saddam Hussein, his sons, uh, uh, you know, special unit, identified where they were, launched a conventional unit to go take them out. And they were in one building, one hardened building. And that's the, the conventional unit firing no less than 10 tow missiles at the building. Uh, strafing it with multiple types of uh, attack helicopters and, and having zero effects on the enemy that they're just trying to kill inside the building. But ten, they launched 10 ton missiles at the building. That's just a misunderstanding of capabilities versus the physical terrain of urban areas. But not all urban areas are the same. Next slide. So here is probably the if I were to find in another class that urban means, by definition, urban is that physical terrain, a population, and the infrastructure to support it, there is no urban battle that I have ever studied in, in the history of war that there haven't been civilians present. 
So should that make it harder to conduct a military operation in urban terrain? Logic for me is absolutely it should. It, as soon as you enter the urban terrain, there are protected populations and protected sites in accordance with the law of war that are going to not, could constrain the use of force. And I can show you, and we can show you, and General Wars is a big fan of, of the Battle of Manila and the Battle of Seoul, even in the most high intensity, lethal type of military operation you can think about, like the battles of World War II, the battles of Ukraine, there is a constraint on the use of force. It is not a free range period. It never has been, it never will be. You get into the urban terrain, there are constraints on the use of force from General MacArthur not wanting to use air power in the middle because he didn't want the jewel of the Philippines destroyed. So that was the guidance. You won't get that asset. You won't get those fires or whatever it is. So there's automatically a, a limitation on the use of force. And we have one of the world's leading experts on uh, civilian harm mitigation and, and all aspects of what that means to the military. And my friend, uh, Sahar Muhammad Ali, will give a presentation. I won't steal any of that. In the urban terrain, we also do populations. And I hear it all the time, and you'll probably hear me doing it. Okay, yeah, presence of civilians means that, again, this is why I argue that it's harder than Arctic warfare, high altitude warfare where your weapons don't even work, or jungle warfare, whatever, because there's civilians present. And there are in no other environment other than that density of civilians present. So I can almost put all the debate to sleep by just saying civilians present. That's going to make it the hardest environment to achieve the military objective on the planet. But we also view the civilians as a obstacle, as a, a big challenge that we're going to deal with. So a lot of times we'll, we'll add them into our, our military training exercises, like, okay, there's civilians there, and you, got, you, can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do that. But you're also, again, holding in your mind some type of permissive type of fights or some scenario in your mind when, you know, the presence of tens of thousands of civilians can mean a lot more. Because those civilians can either be supportive of you, non-supportive, as in each one of those, there is a decision on whether they're combatant or non-combatant, and there are rules and regulations to that. And they could actually be resisting. And I'll talk about in cases where that happens. Or they could be neutral, as in what you do turns them into supportive or non-supportive even in a high intensity offensive defensive scenario. But we all just have civilians on a guy that they're a problem and we have to do these things. You'll learn, like, especially like in Ukraine, like they could also be resisting and be that line between the actual combatant and non-combatant. And you haven't calculated that into your scenario at all, but just an obstacle, let the CA, the, the Bands 5, whoever deal with those civilian issues. I'm here to kill the enemy in the urban train. But you just said urban, which means there's presence of it. Uh, the Indian Three Block War, I won't cover much. Uh, a famous general coined a term. We all love mental models and heuristics and things that stick and make it easier for us to do things. So the Three Block War was a comment in an article that ended up doing, you know, basically becoming it, its own thing. And I can now say Three Block War. What, what does that mean? Well, that means when I enter the urban train, because again, again, I said, there is no urban train without civilians. If you're thinking about urban train without civilians, or you're training urban train without civilians, you're just wrong, because if you remove the civilians and all, and all you have is buildings, it's not urban train. It's, it's, an, it's not. Uh, but the three block war means that in a modern battlefield, and this is a fact, there's General Kulak, a Marine that wrote it, so it meant the Marines, you could be fighting a high intensity battle on one block against a pure enemy who got to the urban train before you did, while on the other block you're doing lower intensity combat, peacekeeping, stability, and on another block you're doing humanitarian aid and, and civilian protection, all within a three block, and that's the actual reality of the complexity of the urban train and why it's the hardest on the earth to fight. Next, next slide. So this is Another arguable aspect, and we'll talk about this again in Urban 101, what does it mean urban strain is the information domain, right? Along with the three-block war was also the concept of strategic corporal, 
when your know, tactical actions of a single soldier can have strategic implications. Well, in the urban terrain, unlike any other terrain on the planet, all right, so if I send you into the woods of Finland, there's not going to be a camera on every tree. I send you into the urban terrain, and there's going to be a sensor almost covering every inch of it. And these are my examples so I can watch the Battle of Kiev live. That, I could, I, from day one to today, I can, there are live feeds in Ukraine, and you can watch and, and see what's going on. Uh, or the, the concept of TikTok wars, you know, the differences in, in, in the access and speed of information as the world has changed, right? The world's more urban, but the world's also more connected. So in, unlike any other terrain, we'll ask the military force to conduct an operation in the urban terrain, you're fighting almost like you've entered a stadium and you're in the middle and the world is watching. And that, had, that makes a big difference across the spectrum from army down to soldier on the conduct of military operations when there's always somebody watching, there's always a sensor collecting. Some of the examples up the top right is the, if anybody recognizes the photo, is the first battle of Fallujah. Right? First battle of Fallujah, we, there's, we wrote, me and Major Drew wrote a case study to know what happened. Um, the US military got assigned a mission in the urban area. Um, we're not factoring in and playing on the information and operation, and that's a photo of civilian casualties during the first battle of Fallujah being transmitted out to the world. The world had a reaction, the national government of Iraq having a, a reaction, all allies a part of the coalition having a reaction saying, you're, you're, you're killing civilians in the conduct of your operations. And the operation was stopped six days into the conduct of the operation because of the information operation that was happening, that the enemy was using to broadcast out what's happening. In the second battle of Nagorno-Karabakh, which I had the amazing pleasure, I get to travel the world and go, go to urban sites because it's, each train is different. In the second battle of Nagorno-Karabakh is one of the first times where you see two commanders tweeting at each other on the success that they're having in the war. That's different than war in the past, enabled by the information domain of urban areas, where everything is visible, everything's connected. We can see and transmit at a speed unlike any other place because of the urban areas. Next slide. So complexity. Uh, General Woods uh, is a little big fan of strategic compression. So when we were doing magazines, we talked about complexity. What does complexity mean? Uh, one of the definitions, and I don't get into this, I, I didn't go to Sam's and, and, and argue all these things, is that basically it means, one, it means if you touch it, it changes. Two, it means if you touch it, it changes. You don't, you can't calculate, calculate the second and third order effects of your actions. So if we have a big battle in, in, in the woods or in the jungle, I can you can calculate, like, well, I'm going to destroy this much of the rain. All right, you know, have this. It's, it's, you can figure it out. When a military conducts operations in the urban terrain, the complexity and the second and third order of effects are unlike any other terrain on the planet. Because cities or urban areas are now connected unlike they've ever been in history, both locally, regionally, and globally. Where you can do, have a military operation, and without you knowing it, you just impacted the global food economy or the global information banking system or this this and this the complexity of it is unlike any other terrain and why i strongly argue that it's the hardest whether it's the conduct and military operations where i saw what you did and the president next day sees what you did or you blew this up and now the entire 80 million person population is without water that, that level of complexity is only in the urban terrain. So shouldn't that mean that we plan things differently? You would think, but that's currently not where we're at, and that's why this course exists. Next slide. 
So this is a, a, another big one, and we'll talk about this, and, and, and Major Drew in his class will talk about the historical data. Be very suspicious when one of us says the data says, right? So any, and this is my world of academia. Well, the data says this. The, the data says that. Well, what data are you talking about? What is your data pool? Like when did, if you're studying urban warfare, and I have friends that argue this, and the, the data doesn't show that defenders win, or the data doesn't show you need, you take more casualties. The data, or what's your data set? Well, it stopped after you know, World War One. It's from World War One back, or it's from Vietnam War back. Like, well, I just told you that the entire world's urbanization, population density, all that changed. The size of military has changed. There are continuities in urban operations, but they're also changes. So just be, I'm just saying very respect. I say, it's not John Spencer says, US military doctrine says, based on their study of all wars, that in the urban strain, you're going to need more. We mentioned at the very beginning about just force ratios, which is a very complex ad, you know, thing. Three to one. So because we like military, we like training, uh, planning, Assumptions and planning model, right? So three to one. This scenario equals this. This complex analytics for all of them. Three to one. If you're an attacker, the defender, you need three to one. In urban terrain, you need five to one. And I've argued this, 10 to one, 25 to one. And I can show you lots of urban battles where that, that's a fact. Whether it's the 2017 Battle of Mosul, 100,000 security forces around the city to take down 5,000 not even trained bubbles with weapons. Uh, the fact is that you're going to need more. We're going to pick that apart and like, well, I'm going to need more of what? Well, you're going to need more soldiers, airmen, air force. You're going to need more force ratio based on the complexity, the density, all those differences I talked about before. You're going to need more of it. The problem is that we just three to one, five, what, 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 what more do I need? Do I need more infantry? Do I need more fires? Nobody's figured that out because there are, you know, every mission is different, but let, uh, we'll agree on what, okay, attack. If I'm attacking a defender, how much more do I need? Well, you didn't tell me what city that is. Uh, you gotta tell me what the terrain is like. And, and I'll, we'll talk about like, like, if I'm the urban guy at the table, like, well, does, is there an underground? That's attacking a city that doesn't have an underground versus attacking one that does, night and day to what I'm going to need. Or what is going to impact. So casualties, you're going to take more casualties. That's not me. Again, that's not going to say in urban terrain, based on our history, like US military, you take more casualties. So what does that mean as a planner that I need to do? Well, I need more medical resources. I need more logistical lines to support casualties. Based on this scenario, this mission, this urban terrain, well, can I use the hospitals there? No, you can't. You want to take more casualties, so that should equal different planning aspects. You're going to need more ammo, and I almost still my Major Drew's comments. You need more ammo. Historically, you need more of all of it, uh, and, and this bakes into from the tactical to the operational. Well, what ammo? We need more grenades. We need more fires. There, there's some really fascinating, and I'd love to be part of these, in sidebars we can talk about even maneuver warfare. It's always been firing to support something maneuvering. Arguably, in urban terrain, it may be maneuvering so you can fire on something. And, and, and that will, will really blow some people's mind in a, in a certain conversation. When you start to think about that and look at historical examples of they're not using fires to maneuver. They're maneuvering to fire and finish the enemy in the urban terrain with a very specific type of fire. Need more? You need more food. You need more water. There is more risk. Uh, the urban warfare doctrine, which is amazing that you have it in front of you, uh, thanks to General Woolridge and team, talks about the risk considerations of the operation. We like to hand wave those risks and just say, okay, when, when the war kicks off, like, well, you know, that, that's a, we're not going to worry about that risk. That
we're, we're going to fight a deliberate attack against a, a, an enemy. That's not reality. All those risks are missing in doctrine. We'll talk about whether we even factor those in in our short examples here of the war deeds that we do. Are you calculating the impact of the commander on all those different risk elements? Next slide. So I just talked about a lot of the reasons why it's hard in reality, which you understand military mission, urban terrain, and why it's hard. Well, I've been doing this for a little while, from literally from the four-star level to congressional level. One of the biggest reasons that fighting or doing, conducting military operations in urban terrain is so hard is us. All of us. Because we will not change. Change is hard. I, I've studied why, answering like why the military designed this, this, this way, that way. A lot of times people want to add logic to it. Again, like, well, we change because of the lessons of, of war. Right? We change the size of the squad, let's say. The nine man squad. And when actually you dig down there, no, that wasn't, it wasn't the, war, the evolving character of warfare that drove that. It was this other reason, the size of the vehicle, like all these things. Uh, one of the biggest obstacles is us. We refuse to orient ourselves on the urban, even when, and these are the, just a few examples, the most senior leader who has experienced urban warfare for themselves and are in charge of entire armies and say, we must change and make urban the number one thing we're preparing for because it is the present element of warfare. From General Milley, when he was the chief staff of the army, to when he's now the chairman, like all this talk about earth. But what's what's the change? General Nero, same thing. And now General Rainey, who fought the same battle we do, is it is as a future commander, we've got to adapt ourselves across that mill PF or across the entire joint force to, to focus on urban training. But next slide. In our world, we talk about uh, capabilities, right? So I, I like to be very specific. So if, if for over a decade, literally over a decade, every senior leader in the US military said that we must change, whether you, literally at the commencement speech at West Point, you will fight in urban terrain. Or I call it to every military, you will fight in urban terrain. We must adapt ourselves. Okay, well, we've been saying that for over two decades, actually. Where, where's the beef, as the commercial said? <laughs> this is not PF, yeah, which is for the US military, how we do requirements, right? Doctrine, organization, training, material, leader, and education, personnel, facility. Doctrine, we have doctrine. Uh, we could talk about whether we read our own doctrine. And I have to flip it. I actually firmly believe people read doctrine when they need it, like in a course. Like if you go to a course, uh, PE course, and you get assigned an urban operation, you're going to go Google for the urban doctrine and start reading it, and hoping that it helps you with your assigned mission. Uh, so if we have doctrine, and, and they update it sometimes, but I don't know if it, people are using it. Organizations, there is no organization in the U.S. military outside the California National Guard who specializes in even thinking, talking, working on urban terrain. It just isn't that. We used to, there was one that intent that something called the Berlin Brigade. There are a couple other examples. Even in the British military, there's a uh, the, the four PWRR. The, one client said, I'm the urban people, but, the, but I'm not. Uh, there was used to be something called the Asymmetric Warfare Group within the US military. Well, it was, we're going to start on that. That had people who were assigned like a near the next urban area company, team, gone, uh, training. General Ward said, and I can actually talk to the entire world about the different training that there is for urban warfare. Stops at the company level. Usually it's focused on the actual individual shooter, and it's only focused on shooting and breaching. Uh, but even within the US military, if, if all of our leaders say that we have to prepare soldiers to fight in urban terrain, well, where's the training course for that? There are two courses in the special communities that work on shooting and breaching in urban terrain. There used to be an urban mobility breaching course for us to teach you how to breach the urban terrain because you want to do a lot. 
That was closed recently. Um, there used to be underground warfare, which I do both like right, urban and underground. There used to be some work being done on underground warfare, and there's, now there's doctrine. But we actually spent half a billion dollars one year training every brigade combat team on a MTT, which uh, Master Sergeant Joe Bay will come in later this week, was the proponent that he's the, lead, the world's leading expert in conducting tactical operations underground because everything changes. But we don't have it anymore. It was, it was one effort to train all units. But I, and did any of you attend that MTT? No. So it's not around anymore. Material. If I, if you believe me that the urban warfare is different than any other type of terrain, shouldn't we have different equipment, different vehicles, different types of munitions? And we do. We got low collateral precision gun munitions, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I don't think it's the type of change our leaders were talking about, saying that we will train, man, and equip for urban terrain. We will put it as the most likely environment. If that was true, then everything would change, right? Basic training to whatever the course is, which would start with the hardest environment, urban, and then work down to the, the less simple. But right now, our mental model is, I'm going to take you to a flat piece of earth, almost a, a, a football field, and I'm going to train you in the basics that will apply to any terrain. That's literally our, our methodology. Uh, so we, we have a few minor pieces of material and there are lots of people who work every day on developing capabilities. And I've interviewed many of them, from C, through concrete, the use of drones, all this thing. But the actual intel of a military unit is you're going to find it very hard to find a piece of equipment designed for the specific challenges of urban terrain. Even if it's planning tools, and we'll talk about that. There are planning tools and, and GIS layering and all this stuff that help figure things out in the urban terrain. But I, I can, I, I actually used to spend a lot more time in NTC than I do right now. Now I'm going to an NTC rotating units talk at the brigade level, and, and there's nothing in there but acetate and two dimensional maps. There's nothing even being used of the urban technologies that have been created as the, the starting point of sending a, a unit to war. Uh, there's always this idea of reach back. So leader in education, like I talked about. Yes, I can point to I know where all the all the touch points are. I kind of that's my I love to do I love to travel to see urban training sites all around the world. I've been to not all of them, but I'm, I'm working my way through them to see what they replicate, what they provide, and the ability to train and educate soldiers. But outside, there used to be uh, we talked about a unit based system. There's actually many solutions to this, and there's. You're throwing money at the problem is usually the solution. Um, usually it becomes cost prohibitive, where I've been a part of many planning efforts at the Army level where, hey, we need to get ready for urban. Like, okay, let's, let's for a week put ourselves in a room and think through, like, what, what do we need? And usually the answer is we need to build a mock state. Right? And, and literally the solution that I was a part of was $80 billion to build a mock mega city in the desert of California. Um, it's almost like a throwaway code. Like, nobody's going to do that. But they actually moved forward with it. They didn't do 80 billion, but they went through with like 20 billion. But as leaders change out, priorities change out, it all went away. And we'll go to NTC and we'll see the site called Regis that was the place where a mega city was supposed to have been built. And it ended up being $100,000 to do some. Flood mitigation. That's all they got out of that entire F. And personnel facility. Next slide. So this is, uh, again, about the cognitive bias. I'll talk about urban one-on-one. Um, I find, I, you know, I was infantry, so even I have written about uh, the evolution of Battle Drill 6 and how we train the entire military, but if I had, if I was the Secretary of Defense, I would delete Battle Drill 6 today because it's doing more harm than good because it's, it's actually inhibiting military thinking about conducting urban warfare because we think clearing rooms and infantry clearing things 
But even what we do to clear rooms and what everybody loves to train soldiers on now is not the reality of modern urban warfare. It's more, this is the World War II way to do it. This is the way that most people try to train it today of stacking on doors, center point bedrooms, clearing corners, all this stuff. Now, I'm not seeing that in the wars that I go travel around. I'm seeing it in a different type of urban warfare, but not talk tactics, but it's actually in our mental model that if I say urban warfare to most people who've been in the military for a while, they think about clearing rooms. When there have been plenty of battles where I can't find that happening at all. Next slide. So the, as, a, as an academic, you try to take apart the assumptions before you start doing research. So I want you guys to think through the assumptions that you held before entering this course about urban warfare. One of the assumptions we found at the Army level is that most plans, from war plans down to company level planning exercises, they just assume that they're going to move unopposed to the urban area. And, and I, to be honest, the global work on terrorism didn't help us with that. Because we fought in the Middle East, which most of the cities are nodal cities, which are surrounded by deserts. So you maneuver in the open terrain to get to the urban area and then have to surround it or do whatever you do. Um, when there are plenty of places on the planet where the entire operating environment will be urban. You will start in the urban, you'll move through the urban, and you'll fight in the urban. Whether it's the uh, in the in the Pacific, or wherever I I can point to you just by the girth of urban on the planet today, that that, that assumption that I'm just going to move unopposed, you know, and there's a there's an urban area I'm going to move there, <coughs> is not right. And, and and Sahar knows this. The other assumption is that civilians won't be present. I I I would evacuate all this. Thing. Whether that's a um, planning a soul scenario. <laughs> The, the, the war plan is to get a bunch of buses and start busing people out, millions of people. Or just the fact that if, once you, if you surround a city, like in the Battle of Aachen, where the Americans and the Germans multiple times attempted to evacuate the city and there were still thousands of civilians left, the assumption in our planning is always, we'll get the civilians out. When it's literally not, in, in, I've never found that in the history of warfare, where you got all the civilians out of the urban train. It just had a battle inside of it. Whether it's in that, if that's Bach moot today, there's still civilians present. Um, the, the big one for me is time. And there is an act that, okay, fine, I understand, smart guy, um, there's all these considerations on plain urban training, but I need to conduct this exercise and conduct this training and education. There's plenty of battles where the goal is just time, where that is the number one mission variable is that. How long do I, am I being told to conduct this operation or how long do I have to think that this operation will take? Where it, it can actually be the matter of success or failure is the variable time in the urban training. And that's kind of my argument on the defense. A lot of people think that you know, defenders lose. Well, what's your definition of winning? Sometimes the definition is just to buy time. There's plenty of large scale combat operations where that time that was bought in that urban training meant the success of the campaign. You know, just, just to hold your ground for a while. Um, the other assumption is that we can control information, which we can talk about, like, right? Major Drew, one of his principles of success is isolating, isolating the urban area, right? That's a variable of most military mental models of how to conduct the operation. You isolate the urban area. Well, by, by the definition of isolate, that means you you completely isolate it from physical and information. Can you cut that urban area off of all information? Yes, we have seen some things like soccer attacks in Georgia where there's a little bit of success, but we've also seen where there's not. If I said that the information domain is the one variable that makes it this, the most difficult terrain, why do we continue to plan, train, and educate people that uh, we're going to implement these steps and we'll control the information of that rather than fight in it, we're going to control it. Matter of fact, I think control is one of our heuristics in the U.S. military, is that we can control the environment. Matter of fact, we're going to plan a bunch of things to control it. There is no controlling the urban terrain. There is no controlling information in a modern battlefield. You have to fight for it, you have to fight in it, um, 
And that has all kinds of implications on policy, on the level of authorities, all of these things. But we, 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 the other aspect is that most Russian militaries are offensively based. That's a fact. I actually, um, try, I actually tried to be audacious at a, a very large NATO conference that Dr. King and I were at with NATO, right? It's a defensive alliance that doesn't talk much about defending anything. <laughs> Because most Western mental models, most Western, if you talk multi-domain operations, you've ever seen a presentation on our new operating concept, it's about attacking. We're gonna penetrate with a penetration division, we're gonna have deep fires, everybody is attacking. Well, that's not the reality of modern war. Somebody's defending something. And a lot of people are gonna be asked to defend urban terrain. If we, talk, we can talk all day whether the, the, the decisive battle of the Second Nagana Karabakh, Susha, uh, where they failed to defend it and the war was over because of that one battle, or in like Key, where they defended and won the battle for Ukraine because they defended it. But all of our operating concepts, I'm telling you, are offensively based. They don't include urban and in the or maneuver warfare, and they don't talk about defending anything. I think that's an issue with our assumptions. And then I, I talked about no restrictions at all. So uh, military units will think that it's a free fire of range and drop a nuke on it, whatever it is, uh, in the application of force based on the scenario that they, these are literally the futures people, right? What is the future fight going to be and what will be the restrictions on the use of force? Like, well, I, I'll have all the things, all my assets, all my joint multi-domain assets, and there'll be no restriction on the use of it. Well, I, I told you, once you're in the urban terrain, there's always a, a restriction. So we'll think about that. On the flip side, what we talk about, when I talk about MTC is that, so the global war, war and terrorism, in some mission sets, there are great amounts of restriction. And it, it, there are a cultural implications of that, where you find people being given a mission in urban terrain and self-imposing restrictions on the use of force because they don't, they believe they know what the rules are. Well, you can't use smoke. You can't use white phosphorus. You can't do this, this, and this. And all the OCs from the from uh, the CG to the COD, everything. Like, Why didn't you do this? Well, we can't do that in urban training. Who said? Because again, mental models. Literally, people who haven't had experience in major combat operations in urban terrain, but now our commanders and leaders will self-impose restrictions. On use of force because of the urban terrain, because it actually has like a, a bad vibe, right? It's like I don't want to do that. It's going to be hard. Uh, I could be that strategic effect because of my commands. But it's scary. Uh, so they'll self-impose restrictions on themselves. The you know, infantry-centric fight. Uh, I am a strong believer as an infantryman. Urban warfare is not an infantry fight. It's just not. To combined arms fight, and the only and the greatest success to preventing it from being the great equalizer, to preventing it from being the hardest, is the person who can combine all their tools at the right place and time. Like that's what we say, but then we always, oh yeah, we need more infantry. Got to clear. How long does it take to clear a skyscraper? Well, that's so that's a that would take a battalion for a floor. That'll take us a week. Of it, you know, that's a lot of infantry, right? One, why are you clearing a skyscraper? It's a separate competition you can have, but my answer to how to clear a skyscraper is you don't, based on the mission set. And they, if the enemy puts himself in the skyscraper, great, now he's contained. Uh, and, I, and maybe I can call in some Excalibur or something like that to, to have my effect. You're not clearing it, but there is a heuristic that urban warfare is an infantry centric battle. It is not. With combined arms, you need, especially again, offense and defense. That's what we're going to focus on. If I, if I, if I, if I start to steer today, focus me back on, like John, you said, offense, defense, stability, and discount. Okay, in the offensive, since we're offensive base, when I think of the co or if I'm a planner, I'm assigning this brigade to go do this mission in that urban terrain. Yes, they should have infantry, but they better have. Some different type of engineering assets. They better have mobile protective firepower. They better have air assets. They better have 
electronic warfare assets. You better have all these things. But we, for some reason, revert to well, I mean, maybe you might know that. Uh, and then lastly, which is the capper of all of this and why this course exists, is that the urban terrain is a condition, not a task. Our armies work in task condition standards. So attack, defend, all that, that's the task. And, but the condition is in this environment. Where I strongly believe that urban is the task, the thing in urban terrain, because there are so many things that make it different that it actually changes everything. You no, know, you can't do all the same things that you would do in that environment in the urban terrain. Next slide. Uh, so if, if you believe me that it's not the condition, it's the task, which task do we need to prioritize? Uh, well, this is a, an actual doctrine pan which I recommended where some really smart people said, fine, let's, let's narrow this down and say, okay, let's train people on three essential tasks that will only be conducted in the urban terrain and, and we'll figure all the dot mill PF out for that, right? Isolate an urban area to include the logistical lines. And we'll talk about that. Penetrate an urban area. And then gain and maintain contact with the enemy once in the earth. Just three tasks. Uh, well, this was cut out of the operating concept and this went away. But I think this is really smart. Like, if I could just prepare the military for three things to do, these would be the three things that I would do that. Next slide. Uh, a lot more city attacks. Next slide. Uh, yeah, this is John Spencer's. If you understand uh, Brigade Combat Team's medals, so that, that's the world we live in. Tasks that we want units to accomplish. They're not all standardized. They're, really to be. they're all standardized, and they're not environment specific. But a long time ago, there used to be some conduct an attack in the urban area, conduct an area defense in the urban area. Those were the tasks that a unit would get and could do a metal crosswalk for. They don't exist anymore because, again, we're not focused on urban, even though our leaders say we should be. Next slide. Uh, we'll talk about this, and I can talk about it in my one on one. One of our challenges is that we can't replicate the urban terrain. We can't even visualize it for our commanders to you know, visualize, describe, the right, that whole thing. Uh, we can't do it, and we, we revert back to two-dimensional in clean, open training areas. That's a huge reason why it's so hard, is that we can't prepare units to do it because we can't replicate it. But how much cities in the desert do we need to train commanders and planners on all the variables of what you're going to need to conduct a military operation. I don't need urban training. I need a time. And I need experts. We have all the time in the world. We don't have experts. You have the greatest gathering of urban warfare experts on the planet in this course. And I, I say that not saying it's me, but in this that will be visiting during this class. And it's like five people. Because the U.S. military has no office, no command, they have proponency, you know, nobody who's allowed to only focus on urban terrain. I'm not, I'm not anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm who I am. The U.S. military doesn't have a guy. The British military does. He's sitting over there. <laughs> so he's the world's leading expert in urban warfare training for the British Army. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, so replicating battle effects, I did a podcast recently. That I deal a lot with training environments. Uh, if you can't replicate the effects of your weapon systems or your military force in the environment, then how are you going to prepare for it? You don't know how, what it takes to penetrate, what it's going to do to that building, what it's going to do to the civilian population. How can you plan what it's going to take to, to accomplish the mission? Next slide. All right, so last slide, I'm going to go quickly through resources. This course is about providing you with tools. The tool can, could be better gained awareness of what it takes. The tool could be leader development tool. The tool could be a playbook, which is um, um, which we want feedback on the gradebook. The gradebook will become um, the Ranger Handbook, the Air Assault Gold Book. Uh, there's another manual that I wrote. It's, it's a playbook. That's a resource. Next slide. Here's some other resources. Doctrine. But if you look at the dates on some of the doctrine, is that yeah, some things have changed since then. 
And actually, we've actually started to delete doctrine as we delete away, move away from Earth. There used to be a really amazing intelligence doctrine manual that got deleted uh, re not too long ago. Uh, and then this one's not in effect anymore. Next slide. Before you go back, just go back one slide. Just so what you know is what's in front of you is the second one, Urban Operations, which we just came out right after our last course. And then the dot 11, what you have in front of you is the draft doctrine that is not that you don't have 2011 in front of you. You have 2023, maybe 2024. I got, I know Colonel Pitts is sitting right here, but I got special permission from the doctor, the guy who wrote it to give it to you as draft, not for implementation, but you can see where it has gone in the last 12 years. To John's point, we, we're only updating doctor, urban doctrine once every dozen years or so, but that is the diff, that is the uh, competitive advantage that you have in coming to this course. Now you have draft, final draft doctrine, again, not for implementation, so that the uh, uh, MCO doesn't assault me by trying to put out early doctrine. But this is so that you can see Brigade and below, right? The dot 11 is brigade and below. The 3-06, the second thing on there is division and above. And I actually have to say it, right? The uh, problem is, John, is we'd like to get a little bit of more that we'd like to get some discussion in here, and then I skipped the introduction, so we still need to have time to do that. So you went a little bit early, um, and now we need to finish a little bit early time. to uh, to do some introductions. But so what I used to say about doctrine is there's one define what is doctrine. There's a definition of doctrine. I say there's a big D doctrine and a small D doctrine. The small D doctrine are these book lists on this page. Big D doctrine is the way we do things. All right. It literally is the way the army does things. It's informed by current operations, it's informed by history. But I can tell you that even if it's written in that little book, that might not be the way that we do things. Whether that's in how we staff our brigade staff, on, on how many people is in it. If it's an urban operation, doctrine says that you need more of this, this, and this. And at the staff level, but that's not the way we do things. Next slide. Uh, so the, I work at the Modern War Institute, not the Modern Warfare Institute. Did I say that? No, sir. Okay. Uh, and what I, one of my goals is just to create products, create podcasts. Uh, I appreciate those that don't know about it. Create articles, create reports, um, travel the world, walk terrain, and write about it so that leaders can learn from what I learned. And the Modern Warfare Project at the Modern War Institute is a repository of all that, uh, where there's so many variables that we can't cover in the class that are, are resources available to you, both on a core page, a core page, um, in here. Next slide. Uh, historical case studies that I mentioned, me and Major Drew have a goal to basically cover them all. So when you talk about even these battles, you really know what happened in the Battle of Mosul, the first Battle of Fallujah, or even the Battle of Stalingrad. Next slide. Articles, these are just some of the things that we touch upon because you need different professional military education resources to help understand your training. This course is a great start, but it's really about learning. Next slide. My podcast, if you haven't heard about it. Next slide. And then shuffle's plug in my books. Uh, <laughs> I actually brought 25 of those to hand out. There's more than 25 people here, so if you like Understanding Urban Warfare, which is a book I wrote with Dr. Leon Collins, uh, I have 25 copies of that assignment and give them one to help for free. That's my time. Any questions? Well, now is the time for discussion. So, the, you know, he, he pulled up a great, he, he had a, a great bunch of stuff that was, you guys, that was a master class at fire hose level on assumptions and urban warfare. So um, we talk, he talked about tools, right? So just so that you can see in the gray book, an example would be, he talked about specific pieces of equipment. So down in sustainment, down in page 93, we have specific pieces of equipment like a sawzall, a halligan tool, ladders, ropes, grappling hooks, other things that you as planners would need to make sure that somebody has the government purchase card, right? This course is not about you putting a ladder up against the wall. This course is about you ordering 500 ladders for a battalion, right? So we talked about the training. And so specific training, that you're here getting training too, but maybe we talked about breaching. An example we have on page 32 is everybody in the American Army is familiar with the combat lifesaver, right? 
A combat lifesaver is a infantry soldier or an armor soldier, a, a combat armed soldier who has a minimum amount of medical training to stabilize somebody for transport, right? They can stop bleeding. They can start an IV, at least back in the day when I started IVs, right? There's a concept on page 32 of a pioneer, which our Commonwealth brothers and sisters have in the, in the British and the Canadian Army. A pioneer is a combat armed soldier who's trained on basic demolitions and basic engineering tasks. So they can breach the obstacle that's on a stairway, right? They can breach the obstacle that's between two buildings. And maybe, maybe you, I'm not expecting you to go to a pioneer school, but maybe you pr present to the division commander Sir, I have an idea. Let's pull off a couple of engineers on the engineer battalion. We'll set up a quick pioneer school. We'll teach all with every squad and in every infantry company or every armor company. We'll train a pioneer so that we'll take two days out. We'll give them all that stuff they need to be just enough to be dangerous. They'll learn. Do I have any engineers in here? They'll learn P, P for plenty, right? So we'll learn P for plenty, right? That's how much how much explosive should you use? Plenty. Right. So um, they'll learn that. But that's that's what we're talking about is to give you that, that. That's what this book is. And as we talk about Sahar, for example, all this stuff we talked about, the civilian aspects. Sahar, Sahar has well, it's like 10 pages of all the stuff that you need to know and the tools that you need to take away. So if it's not in there, if it's not in here, if there's like a tool that you wish you had, that's one of the things that we want you to talk about. So, OK. So I'll throw this out for discussion, right? Because we should be discussing. The Army talks about controlling the narrative, right? In the information space. Controlling the narrative. The Army talks about controlling a lot of shit. Controlling the narrative. Is there anybody in here that thinks, anybody here is on Twitter, anybody on social media? Does anybody here think that the United States Army can control social media? So up to you. Let's, let's, let's talk about control. Let's talk about any of those things that, that he just brought up. Questions, raise your hand. Now's the time to say back in Fallujah, this is what I thought. Or if you don't believe that urban warfare is not the hardest, let's hear it. Your somewhat controversial statement without people, it's not a sin part. The challenge is if we could get rid of all the people, which is nonsense and will never happen. I would say it's still a city fight because it's still the most compartmentalized kind of terrain and still the most protected kind of terrain. But I will stand shoulder to shoulder with you and remind the entire group, Pavlov's house in Stalingrad had 1418 people hiding in the basement, civilians. They will always be in any city fight. So one of the funnest projects or papers I ever wrote was, can you destroy a city? I wrote an article, so I had to define City. There's no agreed on definition of city. Like across the world, there are different definitions. Most people think it's an it's a urban area with over 50,000 residents. But in some places, you need a rural decree to, to classify it as a city. Uh, but then, it, what is it if you believe which actually shares the root of civilization? So the assumption was if I destroy every building in a city, every building, is that city destroyed? Because that's really. In the global war on terrorism, some of the people were saying a lot of them, there's a, a, a saying from the Vietnam War, it's actually about a village. Destroying the village to save it. Destroying the city to save it. If you destroy every building in the city, is it destroyed? So then I had to go back to history on the on Carthage. You know, that was the city that most people agree was destroyed. And if I actually looked at history, it wasn't. It was raised to the ground twice. And it was only destroyed, and to include killing everybody, it was only destroyed when they moved the purpose of the city and why it was there. They actually took the port away and moved the port farther down the river. Then the city died. So it's a great, great uh, segue to that fascinating story about what is a city? Can you destroy it? Uh, are we fighting in a city? City versus this urban area, there are differences. Like people talk about in Bakhmut right now, I, I try to keep up with it. It's a city of a 70,000 uh, former residents. No other questions? I'm interested. You know, so I'm from Maneuver Center, right? And I sit in modernization updates for CG a couple times a month. I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on General Milley's comments about restructuring the Army. 
because I, I can tell you in two years, I've never heard urbanization, reorganization for urban fight. I haven't heard that discussion one time. What do you think a army at division or brigade and below that's restructured for an urban, but not just the match, what do you think the force structure would look like? So that's a very interesting question that I get all the time. Actually, not just from the US Army, from many armies saying, hey, I, I, I agree with everything you're saying. Tell me what I need to build. Um, well, it's going to be different. So we do it, the US military does it um, based on uh, classified war plans. Most people don't understand that the entire Joint Force is designed against seven war plans, defense planning scenarios. And so you, if you get access, you have to get behind it. Like, where do we think the most dangerous, most likely fights will be in these parts of the world? Because in order to prepare you an urban warfare division, I have to know what urban terrain and what is the most likely mission set. That's why I got to have metal. And then I start to design it. Um, because if I need to secure the logistical route, I need certain types of forces that can secure urban terrain. If I'm going to penetrate urban terrain, then I, I need a lot of bulldozers. Back. I, I know I'm going, if it's contested and prepared defensive. So that's a huge question that people ask me all the time. And that's not what they really paid me to do. I have a lot of thoughts on it's kinds of units that we're talking about here in, in, in Joe Woods, right? In the, even in the book, it talks about mixture of infantry versus armor that you need to for a offensive operation in urban terrain that we don't have today. This is our ideal modernization as well, <clears throat> that we can break apart units and put them back together and have them achieve, achieve the mission. Um, in a couple of case studies, which we did that, like the Second Battle of Fallujah, that's a good example of what you need to conduct that operation. The, the unit it was a division level unit made up of two penetrating armored task forces, infantry, all on military police, civil affairs. It's a great example. But one of the examples I don't like it that it was they, they took nine months to form that, that element. So it wasn't the starting point. Uh, in order to redesign ourselves, we would literally have to design divisions as that is their primary mission, the urban terrain, and they'll adapt for other environments. Right now, knowing the seven scenarios, which when we looked at them in 2014, no department of the U.S. military's scenarios had them fighting the urban terrain. That was mind-blowing. Now there's one. Um, I don't have security punches anymore. Uh, we, this ideal, I didn't put the assumption that uh, of avoiding bypass, which actually used to be in doctrine, in, the, in that doctrine. We used to say commanders will avoid and bypass at all times, basically. But they actually had the word avoid and bypass. But it is still deeply ingrained that prevents us from redesigning force structure. Uh, so I have ideas, and the second battle of Fallujah Division is a great model of that's with that mission of a contested urban environment, that's the division makeup that you need. Sir, do you believe that's the reason why there's not the investment in changing it? Is because you know, senior leaders rotate out, and this would take a, a lot of investment. And you're talking three, five size attacks versus it's easy to, I can take this division, I can do this, and but you know, now you're talking three, four divisions that would have to be assigned for that urban type of fight. So that's probably why we're not seeing that type of change. So that's a, another long conversation. Of, well, I like the why because it. If you look at the history of the U.S. Army, why we made major changes actually is leaders, certain leaders. Like why we went to the striker was one leader who wanted an interim medium weight vehicle. And, and most leaders get like one or two things. And that's what I learned from working with the chief staff of the Army. He actually doesn't have the ability to change much because of all the different rice bowls and all the Everything. They get one or two things, and there's never been a leader who's had that be their thing, moderate, the re reconstructing uh, divisions for urban fights, strong enough to make the change. There are a lot of other reasons, as I learned working for a chief staff in the Army. It's, if you had the right leader set, you could do it, but there isn't. When literally, though all those chiefs of staff in the Army, the Joint Chief of Staff, thinks it's the most likely 
scenario for military forces, but it doesn't equal change. So it's, it's leadership. And it's like the 45th Division leadership said, I'll be the urban people. Now they have certain intel requirements from the bigger armies that you can't. But if you if you follow my logic, like the number one thing we need in the world is people trained and educated for urban areas. That requires no money to change equipment, training areas, building mock cities, nothing. It is the number one gap is that you don't have anybody who would that, that could tell you what changes you need to make. And it's, it's, it's almost like a, a, a skeleton in the closet. Like we don't have, we don't know what to do. Like, so when I get a call going, hey, I just got a guy and I need to redesign X, X, Y military for urban. What's the units I should build? Or when, or when the U.S. Army gets a call and says, hey, we're having an urban warfare conference in PACOM. Send your best urban warfare guy. They call a retired guy, right? Because we don't have you. We don't have, you know, one, one bubble, right? We do have a doctrine writer in EMCO, right? So what is the doctrine writer? What is the urban doctrine writer in EMCO? What is his primary function? That's an adjunct. He's my striker team guy. That's my point, is that the urban warfare doctrine at EMCO is an additional duty. And I so, have a 70%, by the way. Right. If anybody wants to come work at Fort Moore. That's right. right. So, did, you, did, you have a, did you have a question, Colonel Jack? That's how you raise your hand? Yes, sir. I guess the modern urban warfare, uh, there's a lot of uh, great opportunity that the government civilians might take authority in the, in the decision making process. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I was having questions about how that trend might be a possible transition might occur, or are we going to? I, that, I think um, that that's a great question for the Battle of Kiev. He's going to talk about the Battle of Kiev, and one of, from my perspective, one of the interesting parts is when the military said, "Hey, civilians, we need to blow 300 bridges and dams. I'm not going to steal his thunder." That conversation, right? Thinking about that, if I had to defend California and I had to go and talk to my civilian, and I've worked with civilian leadership in California, I'm like, "Hey, we need to blow 300 bridges here." And they're like, "What?" So that's that's a great point. So what I'd like to do is, y'all, Colonel Special will be here the entire time, right? He's going to be with us the entire time as the director of urban warfare training. He's going to make sure that everybody here, you have an opportunity to walk up to him on the brakes. So what I'd like to do, hold on, a question for the virtual class, sir. Okay, one question for the virtual class, and then we're going to take a 10-minute break. I forgot to do the introduction, so we'll, take a, we'll do the the question from the virtual, take a 10 minute break, we'll come back, we'll do the introduction, and then we will get Jason Giroux started on time. So what's the question, Sergeant right, Tom? Um, from uh, Captain Jimenez of the Chilean Army, uh, due to the complexity of planning, preparing, and executing an operation in the urban terrain with respect to evaluating, uh, according to his experience, what are the main parameters slash factors that indicate success in meeting the objectives set for the accomplishment of the mission and how they relate uh, to international humanitarian law of armed conflict. That sounds like a doctoral dissertation <laughs> <laughs> not, not to make, I'm not making fun. I'm just, that's, that's a very complex thing. We will, I, you know, right, we're gonna talk about international um, human rights or uh, international humanitarian law, law of conflict. I try to tackle that and that was just too good. Yeah, no, the answer is expertise. That's the variable you don't have. You don't have expertise in history, because a lot of the things that people have learned are just lessons you relearn. Whether it's that mouse holding is important, or talking, not even knowing the right people in the city to engage with, if you you know you need to engage with city people, the city planner, the NGOs. The, the, the number one variable is military units lack expertise and are actually making it up. All good will and intention in applying a template that they have onto the city because they don't have the expertise. We're going to just take a, a fraction of that in this course. Is trying to give you either where to get the expertise, develop the expertise yourself, or knowing the right um, historical examples that can be applied to other scenarios. And I and I would venture to say that that is the lexicon of urban warfare. Is that when we talk about when we're all planning an operation, we're like. 
hey, let's do a Thunder Run like 2003, because that worked. And then you say, oh, but wait, Suez, you know, Suez, they got isolated and cut off. So understanding the battles by using your history, that is your lexicon of, we've done this before, you know, okay, so how do we prevent the Suez when we're trying to do a Thunder Run? And if you don't understand and you haven't read those battles, you, and, and actually Suez is one of the uh, MWI um, or the Urban Warfare Project's uh, uh, case studies. So if you don't have that knowledge, you're not going to get that here. That's one of the courses that I, I can't wait to be the primary instructor for is the history of urban warfare, right? Or with, there's plenty of people that specialize in that as well. So if you're, if you're a, a, a field grade officer, there's a course for that at CGSC that you can take. Uh, Dr. Luda Marco.